A reading from the book of Acts, the second chapter beginning in the first verse. Listen for God's word. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as, as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea, And all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The temptation had to be there to just just sit back and take it easy. To take take a little time and reflect on all that they had been through. To think about all that had happened to them. And let's face it, a lot 
had happened to them. It was just three years ago. Three short years ago. That they had been going about their business. Doing their jobs. Like catching fish or collecting taxes. When it happened to them. Or when he happened to them Jesus that is and a lot had happened since especially the last few months what a roller coaster ride those had been Jesus had finally set his face toward Jerusalem and they were going with him and despite of everything he had said about how it was going to end they were still thinking that he was headed there for a coronation. They were thinking that he would be the king of Israel, and they would get to be his cabinet. People of honor. People of prestige. Except, That's not how the events played out. Because instead of taking up a crown, he took up a cross. And instead of being given seats of honor, they found themselves on the run for their lives. Then came Easter. Then came Easter. And they still weren't quite sure what to make of it. Jesus came back. He he lived again, but he was only with them for a little over a month before he ascended back into heaven. And now they were left to wonder, what next? What next? Next. So they did the only thing they knew to do. They went back to Jerusalem. Back to that little upstairs room where he had appeared to them on Easter. There weren't very many of them. Only about 120. And they talked. They prayed, and they remembered, and they wondered if it was all over. Was God finished with them? Well, they had to be tempted to think so. To think that they had had their encounter with God and it had been quite a ride, yes. But maybe it was time now to just get back to the way things used to be. Now, understand, they they wouldn't forget Jesus. How could they forget Jesus? They wouldn't forget the things that he had taught them. They wouldn't forget the miracles he had performed They wouldn't forget that horrible Friday when he had died. Or that joyful Sunday when he had come back. But maybe, just maybe, God was finished with all of that. And maybe God was finished with them Now, I don't know about you, but I admit that sometimes I kind of feel the same way. Oh, now I can look at my life and, and see a lot of places where God did some pretty amazing and incredible things. Sometimes things I could only see after the fact. 
But sometimes I wonder if it's best now to, to just sort of sit back and settle in and get comfortable. Just get comfortable with, with who I am and who I think God is. Just get comfortable with my relationship with God. And when that happens, there is a temptation to think that, that maybe God has finished working on me. You know, that's a, uh, that's a temptation for churches, too. Churches can start to get comfortable in their own skin. To start to think that they've done about all they can do for God and the world. And settle into a pattern of simply accepting the status quo. A number of years ago, I heard a story about a little Presbyterian church down in Mississippi. I can't tell you that this story is true, but it's, it's pretty interesting, I think. This little Presbyterian church down in Mississippi, well, they had sort of settled in just like that. They had once been a leading congregation, transforming lives and making a difference in their community. But over the years, they had sort of slid into a pattern of complacency. And as the years went by, they got smaller and smaller and smaller. Until finally they realized that something had to be done or they would not survive. So the session finally decided that the best plan was to do some work on their old building. It had been built before the Civil War. And as the years went by, they didn't do a lot of work on it. It was in need of major renovation. And the session decided that it was time. Maybe sprucing things up would bring in a new member or two. So they called in the engineers and the architects to look over the building. And what they found was amazing you see way down deep underneath that church down in the sub basement where where no one had gone for years they discovered that during the civil war Someone had decided to turn that church into a munitions dump for the Confederate Army. And there was enough hundred-year-old ammunition sitting underneath that church to blow the entire downtown sky high. All that power sitting there underneath that church, and nobody even knew it. You know what I think? I think that's what those first disciples learned on Pentecost. God was showing those first disciples that down, way down underneath them, there was power so great that it was ready to blow the lid off of Jerusalem and the rest of the world too. Those disciples found out God wasn't going to let them just sit back and get complacent and go back to their old lives. God wasn't willing to let the church just be 120 or so scared and timid followers who seemed more than satisfied to hide out in that upper room. God wasn't willing to let that happen. So, the wind... The wind started to blow. 
And what started off like a soft breeze turned into a hurricane. And that wind picked up those disciples, got them up, got them on their feet, and they started preaching like their lives depended on it. And the rush of that wind and the sound of those disciples preaching was so loud that the people outside had to stop in their tracks and start to listen. And what they heard amazed them. Because here was this ragtag little group of mostly Galileans, uneducated people from the sticks, in other words, going on and on about the mighty acts of God like a bunch of PhDs in Middle Eastern languages. The second chapter of Acts tells us that by the end of that day, 3,000 more people had become Christians. You see, despite what they may have thought, God wasn't finished with them yet. So the 12 became 120 And the 120 become 3,000. And today that 3,000 has become billions. Because the Holy Spirit moved and stirred them and gave them courage and strength and power. Because God wasn't finished yet. God was just getting started. Friends, God is never finished building the church and building God's people. God's not finished molding and shaping you and me and this church and every other church, just like God wasn't finished with those first fearful disciples who sat there huddled in that upper room worrying about what to do next. You know, those first disciples, they were an interesting group. They were mostly a band of poor, uneducated, common laborers. Nobodies, in other words, as far as society thought. And just like that little church down in Mississippi, those first disciples thought they didn't have very much going for them. Just like that little church in Mississippi, those first disciples thought that their best days were behind them. But God wasn't through with them. And God showed them that there was a power there that they didn't even realize. So when the Spirit started to move, And when that breeze started to blow, they started to do things they never thought possible. Those fearful and frightened disciples became bold and daring. Those poor, uneducated fishermen started preaching like the prophets. That little group of Jesus followers who didn't even know what they would do tomorrow got caught up in that wind and saw visions and dreamed dreams about what God was going to do through them. All because of the power of the Holy Spirit. You know... uh, We Presbyterians have sometimes, well, let's face it, been a little uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit. We don't know quite what to make of the Spirit. After all, we like to do things decently and in order. And a lot of what is said about the Spirit, especially by some of those TV preachers, is simply sensationalism. But the truth is, our Reformed tradition has a very strong doctrine of the Holy Spirit. 
Among other things, we Presbyterians see the Holy Spirit as God's presence with us, moving us and changing us and refusing to let us remain locked in our own preconceived notions of who and what God is and what God's will for the church might be. The Spirit refuses to let us serve a safe God that is simply interested in maintaining the status quo. The Spirit sets us free to serve God and our fellow human beings, as Karl Barth says, to receive the Spirit, to have the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, means being set free and being permitted to live in freedom. Likewise, Jürgen Moltmann says that, according to the testimony of the Bible, people's first experience with God is the experience of an immense liberation of, of being set free for life. The people whom the word of God calls forth and who are possessed by God's spirit experience liberation. Inwardly life can be newly affirmed and outwardly new free spaces for living are opened up. You see, that's, that's what the Spirit does to us. So my friends, let me ask you something. Do we believe in a God who acts like that? As Barbara Brown Taylor puts it, do we still believe in a God who blows through closed doors and sets our heads on fire? Do we still believe in a God with power to transform us both as individuals but also as a people? Or have we come to an unspoken agreement that our God is pretty old and tired by now. Someone to whom we may address our prayer requests, but not anyone re we really expect to change our lives. Which God do we believe in? Friends, I want you to know this. I want you to know that Pentecost teaches us that the same God who moved those first disciples, the same spirit that, that came on the wind still moves today. Like that little church in Mississippi, there is a power here that can blow the lid off of the church. There is a power here that, that still moves, that still transforms lives and churches and communities. There is a power here that takes fear and turns it into courage, that takes weakness and turns it into strength, that takes feeble and frail and fallen human beings like you and me and turns us into sons and daughters of the living God. That is the God of Pentecost. That is God, the Holy Spirit. And you know what? It just may be. It just may be that the breeze is about to start blowing here. It just may be that the Holy Spirit is about to begin stirring here, empowering this church and changing our lives, giving us courage and strength and hope 
and freeing us up to do the things God has called us to do and to be the kind of people God has called us to be. Because, you see, God's not finished with us yet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.